seated. Oh Lord, in your mercy, may you hear our prayer. My friends, hear and believe the good news. Our God, our God heals the broken heart, binds up the wounds of the lost and the lowly. God rejoices in those who place their trust in God, for it is through Jesus Christ that we are indeed forgiven. May we trust in this promise and be renewed for our journey as God's disciples. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, one of the ways that we prepare for such a journey is that we share God's peace, not just with ourselves, but with one another, saying to each other, may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us share that peace with one another. Peace of Christ. At this time, we'd like to invite any of our young folks to come on forward. Come on up, come on up. I'm so glad to see you. Good morning, good morning. I'm so glad to see you. Hey, Taylor, come on up. Hey, Griffey. Oh, I'm so happy to see you guys. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for, oh, hey, Asher, come on up. I'm so glad to see you. Hey, Danny, come on up. Y'all are so gracious to come up. Thank you for helping me learn a little bit more about God. Good morning, Irene. Hey, how are you guys? Hold on. I got something. I, I got to show you. I got something in my pocket here. I want to pull out to tell you. Okay, I have got it here. I want to show you something. You might not have seen one of these before. So use your eyes. Use It is a coin. What coin is it? Do you know? It's, it, it looks like a diamond. 
A dime. It's a dime. That's exactly right. And do we know how much a dime is worth? Does anybody know? Can you tell me, Griffin? Oh, you don't know? Oh, 10 cents. I heard somebody say 10 cents. That's right. And 10, 10 cents is 10 pennies. And on the front of it, on the front of it is, um, I think it's Franklin Roosevelt, I think, is on the front of this. And let's see. I got another one in here. It's a little bit bigger, but it's worth a little bit less. Let's see who we got here. Oh, yeah. We got here. I, all right. Do you know what this one is? Do you know what this one is? A penny. A penny? Oh, it's a little bit bigger than a penny. It's a nickel. That's right. And that's right, John, it's worth five cents, so five pennies. And on the front of it, it has Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson's on the front of it. And on the Thomas back, right there. And Tom, that's right, Thomas is right there. And, and his house is on the back of this. You didn't know that. His house is right there, too. All right, we got one more. This one's a little bit bigger. Can you tell me what this one is? It's a quarter, and it is 25 cents. And do you know who's on the front of it? Can you tell me who's on the front of it? Yeah, it's a little tricky. Do you know? Anybody know? Do you know? Very good, Griffin. George Washington is on the front of it. He's another one of our presidents. And on the back is an eagle. The eagle is a symbol of our country. It's a, our, our country's bird. It is our national bird. Very good, Tinsley. And so... So all of these have presidents on the front of them, and they are our coins that we use to buy things, right? In there. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been tricked by somebody? Yeah. Have you ever had somebody make you say something you didn't want to say or do something you didn't want to yeah. do? Well, Jesus, Jesus, in the Bible, we read a story where Jesus had that happen to him. There were some people who tried to trick Jesus. They tried to make him say some things that he didn't want to say and do some things that he didn't want to do. And one of those things that he did, they handed him a coin and said, said, tell us, who does this belong to? And Jesus looked at it and he said, well, you give back to Caesar what is Caesar's because Caesar had his face printed on the front of the coin. Now, what that means is we give back those things that belong to other people. Do you have a jacket, for example, that has your name written in it? So if you lose it, then they know who it belongs to. Do you have that? Or a water bottle or anything like that, that if you lose it, they can find out where it goes. Well, the same thing is true for us. You are created and loved by God. And so God is in you and a part of you. And you belong to God. And so we give to God what is God's, and we give back to the government what is the government's. So, for example, do we worship money? No. No, good answer. That isn't even a moment of hesitation. No, we don't no. worship money. No. Who do we worship? God. God. Yes, good answer. We, and, that's right. We worship God, and we worship Jesus, and we um, give to God what is God's, and we give to the government what is the government. So, so we don't worship money, do we? We don't sing, money loves the little children, all the children of the Or we don't say, money loves me, this I know. We don't see that, do we? What do we say? What do we say? God loves us. That's right. So we don't say prayers to money, and we don't sing songs to money, and we don't worship money, but we worship God. Now, how are some ways that we give to God? Does anybody want to answer that? What are some ways you think we give to God? Hey, go ahead. Say that again. A rocket ship? Is that what ways we get? What are some other ways that we give to God? You can share. What would be something you'd like to share? Uh, share your necklaces. Go ahead, John. Show love. Share love. I love it. Yes, Miss Ellie. Carrots. Carrots? Carrots. Oh, caring. Yes, yes, yes. Caring and carrots would be good. That's right. That's right. Thank you. That was a good one. Yes, ma'am, Miss Emily. Helping somebody to get up. If they fall down or escape their knee or something, helping them. That's right. Yes, James. You can give him carrots. And carrots. That's another good one. How about you, Griffey? What can you give? Yeah, you can give a house. It's a great place. Yes, ma'am. Sailing. Sailing? Sailing. Sarah? That would be a good thing to give, too, wouldn't it? Hey, Irene, go ahead. You could give it to them in person. That would be a good thing to give too, wouldn't it? So you see, we give 
we give things to God to help God. And even we give money, because we either give money to God so God can use it to help and care for others, just like all those other ways that you told us we can care for others. You have been wonderful. Thank you very much. Would you say a prayer with me? Let's put our hands together. Then let's bow our heads. And let's say, dear God, dear God. thank you for caring for us. And thank you that we always belong to you. Help us to give for you. Amen. Good job, you guys. Thank you very much. You can follow our friends who are right over here. And Our passage for today comes from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27, verses 39 and following. Please listen for a word from the Lord. In the morning, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned to run the ship ashore if they could so they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. At the same time, they loosened the ropes that tied the steering oars. Then, hoisting the, fair, the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the ship aground. The bow struck and remained immovable. But the stern was being broken up by the force of the waves. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners so that none might swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land and the rest to follow, some on planks and others on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. After we had reached safety, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The local people showed us unusual kindness since it had begun to rain and was cold. They kindled a fire and welcomed all of us around it. Paul gathered a bundle of brushwood and was putting it on the fire when a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the local people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, This man must be a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, Paul, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were expecting him to swell up or drop dead, but after they had waited a long time and saw that nothing unusual had happened to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. May I invite you to pray with me? O oh, gracious, loving Lord, each of us has come to this time and to this place for all the different reasons of our lives, but we have returned again so that we would experience your presence, that we would hear your word, a holy word, a meaningful and a powerful word. So our humble prayer is that out of your Holy Spirit you would help us to hear this word, that we would hear it anew, and that it would in some way transform us so that we can strive to be the people you've called us to be, that we could find encouragement to serve our neighbor as ourself, that we might find the strength to show mercy and kindness and love. 
We ask all of this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Do you have a bucket list? Just a quick show of hands. Anybody got a bucket list? I've got a bucket list. Anybody else have a bucket list? You got a bucket list? For those of you who don't know, a bucket list, a bucket list is a list of things that you want to accomplish, do, see, before you kick the bucket, right? Lots of people have them. There are the usual things, the usual things, right? There's skydiving and there's cage diving with great white sharks, base jumping off the north rim of the Grand Canyon or the Eiffel Tower or something. And then there are the risky things, like going to go see the northern lights, salmon fishing in Alaska, the, a cruise on the Greek Isles. For me, mine falls in line with those scary categories. It's to visit is to visit as many of the national parks, the major national parks, as I can. Terrifying, I know. That's why you gotta do it when you start young before you have a family. So back in 2010, Carrie and I, we traveled to St. John's in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It was one of our last big adventures before starting a family. So I wanted it to be good, right? I, I read all the blog posts and the TripAdvisor suggestions found a little bed and breakfast run by a couple that had retired from Boston. It was tucked away up the side of one of the mountains. They had this mother-in-law suite that they had rented to us for the week. The bed and breakfast website, it talked about the pristine beaches and the hidden coves, the wild donkeys that roamed the island freely, and the cool ocean breeze that never ends. It is paradise on earth, the website stated. Oh, it was so exciting. I was so excited. I, I had been on like little short cruises to the Caribbean before, but never pursuing the island like a local. I couldn't wait. Anytime I had a hard day at the office, I'd just pull out my phone and I would look at pictures of Trunk Bay, one of the most pristine beaches in all the world, apparently. And I would look at pictures of sea turtles that swim around the beaches. And in my mind, I would, I would be transported to that lounge chair by the crystal clear Caribbean waterside and the smell of salt air where there were no long meetings. There were no long meetings and there were no traffic jams and there was no Check out lines with, with grumpy cashiers surrounded by yet undeveloped woods, the website promised. You can enjoy a local drink while listening to the calming sounds of the river as it flows by your room. I'll take a week, please. Doesn't it sound fantastic? I have to tell you, it was paradise until we got there. Oh, the folks, they were wonderful, kind, they were hospitable. But we quickly realized that not everything is found in those pictures that you see, right? For example, the mosquitoes. The mosquitoes were prolific. And I'm like a magnet to mosquitoes. So they, you really couldn't sit outside from the room enjoying that local beverage. The river, the river turned out to be more like a creek that kind of trickled by because there hadn't been a lot of rain. The shower, the shower turned out to be an outdoor shower <clears throat> that only had a curtain for privacy. And every time one of those sea breezes came by, that just blew the curtain. We had a lot of perspective on what Adam and Eve went through those first days. We got sunburns from snorkeling. Who knew your back is always up to the sun? They turn into blisters the size of quarters. At night, we lied awake in bed because of the sunburn. And I started hearing this rustling in the leaves. Literally, it sounded right outside the window. It sounded like someone was walking toward our room. There was only an, an eye hook holding the front door closed. So I kept picturing one of those 80s horror films where the zombie rips open the door and pounces on the victims inside. The next morning, our hostess told, after staying awake all night, the hostess told us that the crabs, crabs are migrating across the island. That wasn't on any of the blogs that I had read. <laughs> Needless to say, it did not feel like paradise. Actor and comedian Ryan Reynolds says this, he says, when you have expectations, you are setting yourself up for disappointment which is another way of, of thinking that, that if your expectation is heaven, then everything else is going to feel a lot like hell. 
In fact, have you ever noticed that, that preparing for the trip, it brings so much excitement, doesn't it? And adrenaline. I mean, you get ramped up getting out to the airport, but once, once you got to the terminal and started waiting, you know, once you got to the boat, once you go down the road and you start crossing state lines, then very quickly, very carefully, you know, that energy just begins to fade. Has that ever happened to you? And the reason, the reason is because no matter how excited you are, real life, it catches up with you every time. It catches up with us, doesn't it? The plane gets delayed or even canceled. The ocean view from your cabin on the cruise boat has a lifeboat hanging in front of the window. This happened to us. The only time you got to see the ocean was when the boat swayed back and forth. Traffic jams, right? The road trip is culminated with traffic jams, flat tires. Oh, I forgot to pack my whatever. Think about all that. As we look back at our passage for today, we find the Apostle Paul making his final trip to Rome. This trip, this trip was years in the planning. This moment, this point in his ministry had been in the making probably for the better part of a decade, a whole decade. He had raised money. He had gone around visiting churches. He had raised money to take back to them. He had written letters of introduction explaining his theology. The book of Romans is one of the most beautiful theological books in all the Bible. That's because he took time to write out to them so they knew what to expect. He had sent word to them, I'm on my way. I'm coming to see you. And when you actually read the book of Acts, you find God encouraging Paul about this adventure. He says this, God says, be encouraged. Just as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so too you must testify in Rome. Oh, Paul was planning. He was planning. He had the money. He had his provisions. He had polished his oratorical style. He was ready to preach in that big mega church. Everything was perfect, ready to go until, until, until he got to the boat. Perhaps, you know, perhaps it was the clouds that swiftly came flying in. Or or just how quickly the sky got dark as the boat went out to ocean. Or or maybe when the, the temperature changed so drastically. Or when the storm hit the boat and it was getting tossed back and forth. And the crew, the crew starts pitching freight over the side just to save the boat. Or could it have been when the storm had passed and they had nothing left to eat because they had pitched all the provisions over the side? Or when they wanted to crucify the prisoners? Or maybe it was simply when Paul was washed up on the beach and when he had made a fire, a snake, a snake struck him on the hand, was hanging from his hand. But somewhere along this journey, the adventure, well, Stop being a postcard from paradise. I was with a minister friend of mine the other night. We were talking about his father who had just been diagnosed with brain cancer. We talked about my father who had died over the last year. And and he said this. He said, perhaps, Jim, the greatest challenge for any of us, maybe the greatest challenge any of us face is learning how to live within that gap, between the way we think life should be and the way it really is. I think think he's right. Truth is that there is always a gap. Whether we want to admit it or not, I'd bet each of us here, we have some blog, you know, some brochure in our mind, including pictures, pictures of what we expect life and how it's supposed to go. Eagerly awaiting for you in your South Charlotte home, that's my travel blog would say, are your children waiting to run up and hug you after a long and incredibly productive day at the office. Your sermons, they'll be finished by Monday for that next Sunday. Your inbox, it'll be empty. Your phone calls will already have been answered. A short walk awaits you as you stroll over to the sacred garden on a beautiful, cool fall day to catch up on some of your reading. You can relax there 
as you listen to the sound of the fountain and the cool autumn breeze that gently blows through the ever colorful changing trees, be at peace. I think Ryan Reynolds is right. When you have expectations, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. We might have a picture in our mind of, of what life is supposed to be like, but, but when life always catches up to us, the, the inbox, it's always full. Uh, my voicemail, most days, always full. I, I do get to the Sacred Garden once a week for a little meditation and a center in prayer, but, but I have yet to have a time to take a book in there and relax to that soothing sound of the fountain. Paul thought he knew what he had signed up for. For when he got to that boat for Rome, he knew what he was getting into. But then, then comes the storm. Storm comes like it does for each of us. And the storms of life come, and Paul was tossed back and forth, beaten up and bounced around. I think it's safe to say that, that none of this was on his TripAdvisor website. After seeing what he went through, my guess is that none of us here, none of us would blame Paul if he became a little frustrated, right? I mean, he did everything God had requested of him to do. The thing is, though, it still didn't work out. Even though God had requested him to do them, things still didn't work out. No one would have faulted him, right? We wouldn't have faulted him for getting angry, for pouting around, for shaking his fist up at heaven. Only here is the real miracle of the story. Paul didn't become resentful. Paul didn't become angry or bemoan God. The Bible says, through it all, through all the storms and all the shipwrecks and being bitten by vipers, through all of that, Paul showed gratitude. Not gratitude for the life that he dreamed about having, but, but gratitude for the life he had. Why was he thankful? I think maybe because he understood that all of life, even life itself, is a gift. It's a gift. We haven't earned it. We certainly don't deserve it. Life is something that has freely been given to you, and in the church we have a word for that. We call that grace. It's grace. You see, my friends, just because life doesn't look like the marketing material you have in your head doesn't mean that your life isn't any less miraculous. Just because we live in that gap, that gap between reality and expectation, doesn't mean God is any less a part of your life. God is present and active in your life and in mine right here, right now. And there's always something, something to be grateful for. Perhaps that's why Paul wrote these words to a, another church. He wrote this. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. You see, friends, when you truly begin to recognize and appreciate the miracle that is your life right here and right now, when you appreciate that, that heavenly gift, well then, you can't help but see all of God's blessings around you. It's interesting, you know, what I remember most about that trip, it's not the sunburn. It wasn't the outdoor shower. It wasn't the crabs creeping through the leaves like some zombie apocalypse. What I remember I was waking up, having fresh fruit around this big dining table with the, the husband and the wife and listening to their story. It's been 13 years now, but I remember they, they shared with us their, their celebrations and they, celebrate, and they shared with us their tragedies. I remember them inviting us out on their boat, this little boat, for free of charge. They took us for a cruise around the island. I remember snorkeling and seeing starfish as big as your head and a sweet sea turtle swimming up next to me in the ocean. I remember Carrie and I sitting side by side, watching the sunset over the ocean, just talking about our hopes and our dreams. We talked about growing the family and what that might be like. We talked about how beautiful everything we saw 
truth is, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. My friends, your life is a miracle, a divine gift. Even with all the unmet expectations, the foils and the foul-ups, I hope you appreciate that, the gift, that you would put your hand on your heart and that you would feel that gift beating away inside of you every second of every day. That very heartbeat, that very breath, they're all filled with God's blessings poured out for you, for you. So you see, no matter what the storm you are in or what challenge is coming your way, there's always a reason to be grateful. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of that blessed Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to join me as we stand and sing our song of response. Made me glad.
take those experiences we have in our communities, in our offices, in our schools, and we bring those here to this community of faith, where together we lift up the prayers that others have brought to us, or prayers that are on our hearts, and we, we lift that before God, who hears our prayers and listens to us. So at this time, I invite you to share the names of those you would like for us to pray for this day. Stacy and Drew Brown. Thank you, Dory. For Renee Avery. Thank you, Jody. Betty Parrish. For Betty Parrish. It's so sad, isn't it? But there are a lot of victims that have been a part of the violence that's been going on over there. So we certainly pray for them. Pray for those that have been affected by the violence in the Middle East and the conflict and the war there. And we humbly ask that you would keep these, those that are a part of our prayer list, that you would continue to pray for them this day, but also in the days and the weeks to come. Let us unite our hearts now in a holy prayer. God of heaven, you come to us when we need you. You are there for us when we turn away from you. You are with us in our going out and our coming in. You watch over us while we are awake, and you guard us when we are asleep. For you are omniscient and omnipresent, the Alpha and the Omega. You are our God, and for this, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that, that like that woman at the well, you give us the living water that refreshes us and sustains us. By your Holy Spirit, you fill us and cleanse us time and time again. For in the waters of baptism, you have claimed us as your very own, never to be left alone, never to be separated from you. O oh Lord, as your church, we strive to glorify you by being a light, a light that shines in the darkness. As your church, we pray that you would lead us by your spirit, that we may learn from you how to shine even brighter, that all in our community may know your good news of hope and love and peace. So be with those, those that have worked tirelessly this week to, to make sure that our youth and our children are nurtured and taught in your ways. Grant them rest. Grant them renewal, we pray. And be with those, those in our church that, that serve you every day in, in little and meaningful ways, whether visiting sick friends or praying for those they love, taking food to the homebound members, bringing an extra box of tissue to give to the school, or packing lunch bags for the hungry. Be with them, we pray. For in every little gesture, we are reminded that your kingdom comes a little bit closer. And we pray for those, those that need to feel your presence, O oh Lord. For those around the world in the Middle East and for those that are sick and those that are hurting. For those that are victims of violence. And for those that no one loves. We lift to you those, those in our community that we know who are fighting. Fighting for healing. Fighting for work fighting for relationships, fighting for stability and normalcy, fighting to move beyond the past, fighting to be in the present, fighting to get through another day without their loved one, fighting to remember what it is like to be happy. Lord, encourage us and sustain us to keep fighting, and remind us that there will be a day, a day that will come when we won't need to fight any longer. And that there will be a day when we can trust and rest in the peace of your kingdom. Humbly we ask 
that you might hear this, our prayer, as we pray the prayer your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You'll notice the large basket in front of the communion table. That is our 10 cents a meal basket that we always collect. And the money from that, it goes to help the hungry and the poor in our community. Every single cent that goes into that basket helps to bless those in our need. You know, in the book of Genesis, we read that, that when God speaks, creation begins. And I, and I think that is true even today because God's word and grace and generosity, it creates a new heart in us. Every time we hear God's word, and God's word finds fertile ground each time we share the gifts we've received. In every moment and in every place of our lives, the gifts we offer this morning in this service will feed those who come to Avondale hungry for God's love. We will offer a warm welcome that spills over into the world that God loves and is reaching those far beyond these walls. So let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and in praise. Let us bring forth our tithe. Lord God, in deep gratitude for this moment to live as changed people, because after experiencing your grace, we cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, expect much from us, enable much by us, encourage many through us. We offer these efforts with boldness knowing that your love is stronger than our impurities and imperfections. In Christ's name, amen. 
Would you join me as we stand and sing our closing song, All God's People Said, Amen. Give thanks to the Lord for